Let me welcome everybody. I, I am Aaron Freeman, a sciencey optimist, where I am sciencey and optimistic Monday through Friday and exceedingly optimistic today. Thank you for watching now. Thank you for watching live. Thank you for watching later in the feedback, the playback on YouTube at all. So my brother, Nick Gross, physics professor at Boston University and fellow improv science member. And we are going to talk about hockey. And Nick, will this conversation make us all better hockey players? Uh, based on my abilities, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, <laughs> honey. So I've been on I've been on skates. I can probably count um, the number of times that I've been on 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 things that slide or roll. I, like on like that. Th th it's not that many, right? <laughs> Maybe three. Uh, um, skate. So I I think what's interesting is a a friend of mine was very good on these things and she uh did a lot of rollerblading inline skating when it was uh when it was when it was popular and went to learn how to like do snowboarding and they she took like she signed up for a, a beginner class and they pulled like three of them out of line after like the first 10 minutes and said what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And it turns out that one of them skis, one of them was an inline skater, and one of them was already you know, on a, a skateboarder. And they were like, okay, you guys come with us because you don't need all this. Yeah. Um, and in the time that I've been on ice or skates or a, a slippery surface, it's been, uh, it, it's, you know, the cartoon version of, of like with a, legs and the arms well yeah it's exactly what it looked like and i ended up on my ass right. so, <laughs> so, say that you can't edit this can you <laughs> but it's, it's, it's uh social media so, and, and i ended up on my butt and uh and okay so we will not you will not become a better and no one will become a better uh hockey player by knowing some of the physics attended to hockey playing right but and, I think what I think it's interesting though that these all these things, all these skills all have some there's something tied in together, right? And and this is something we can ask you know, maybe Peggy or somebody else about at some point in time. I'd love oh. love to have that conversation. Why are those why are those what is it about being wired that way or and or having learned that one skill that's transferable. What's the transferable skill um, that you for, 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 well, for, for hockey? But, but there's also yeah. some really interesting physics involved in the NHL playoffs that we are all, well, you don't care much about because the Bruins are out. And I, for me, they're a source of humiliation. But there's still, <laughs> it's still hockey. It's still hockey. It's still hockey. And so there's some really wonderful stuff. So let me just ask you, uh, for example, right here, uh, to this, to explain what we got right here. All right. Okay. So, yes. Uh, what, yeah, what so I, was looking, I was looking at, at uh, some of this earlier just to, to brief myself, uh, 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 get myself in the right mind, mindset for this. And so um, we're looking at the feet of a skater. And I think if you, um, I think we're, we're looking down, right? So we're right. looking down from the top. Um, I'm not sure if this goes both ways, but yeah, we're looking, let's say we're looking down at the top and we're looking at the skater's footprint so right. on the, on the ice. And so this has to do with uh, Sir Isaac Newton. This has to do with Sir Isaac Newton. And so if you were to try and when you try and walk on ice, when I try and walk on ice and I try and walk like I normally, like I normally walk, right. Boop, 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 boop. I'm trying to push back right. on the ice to push me forward, right? So right. The, the force of friction actually turns out to be I'm pushing against the ground and the force of friction is going against that and pushing me forward, right? Right. Right. So, right. And so your back leg. So, and I can't, when I'm on ice, I can't break that mental. 
Oh, I see. Right. So because that, that's what this is an illustration of the fact that when you you can't just walk the way you normally walk when you're you on ice. Just walk the way you normally walk. Right. You actually. Um, so I, if I if you push back, there's no friction there, right? Or right. very little friction, and you quickly break. You quickly overcome that friction, and so and then your back foot tries to push back on the ice. So you're pushing your back foot back and it just get, keeps going back and yeah. you're done. And but, then you're, and then you're not on your butt, but you're on your face. Right. And so this little illustration kind of shows that, uh, that in order to move, to move forward on ice, one has to not push backwards, but push sideways. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that if you were to able to turn if you could flex your hip in such a way that you could turn your blade so that it was 90 degrees the direction of motion yeah. so that that uh can can you see my pointer? I can't see your pointer. No. Okay. So oh, the you, the this, alpha angle this this where the little funny squiggly fish like thing. Yeah. Okay. If that angle was like completely open to 90 degrees. Uh -huh. I mean, if you could turn your back, yeah, yeah. If you can make your blade yeah. that way, that'd yeah, be great. Because then, then you get a lot more force. Yeah, your blade is digging into the ice, and you're pushing yourself forward. We want to just say hello to our beloved uh, Lady Ander, who's calling us from uh, from Mexico. Ooh, Lani. excellent! Oh, Lani is wonderful, and she's really great and fun, and a very active participant. In the, she's the star of the uh, uh, Science Today family. Welcome, Which, welcome. So now one of the really fascinating things about hockey is the motion of the puck on the ice. Mm -hmm. The puck obviously travels much faster than the players. It won't even you, it's, you with a flick of a wrist, the puck can end up all the way at the other end. So why in the physical heck is it that a puck can travel so far along the, the surface of ice? Doctor Gross. <laughs> so I so uh, there's a couple of things going on there. So your your frictional force. So the puck is undergoing even less friction, um, because and friction is this is weird. Friction is very there's there are people who spend their entire career studying friction and studying that interaction, and we've got some simple models that we teach to the undergraduates that are all broken. <laughs> what does that mean? Friction is broken? What does that mean? Um, that they are, they don't, they only, they only approximate the frictional force in certain regimes under certain circumstances they do give you a nice qualitative – what they give you is a qualitative view of, of friction. They give you a, a good qualitative description. You can do some calculations with them, but you wouldn't want to um, build a bridge with that. You, you'd want to do some more work. So, but the friction of ice is very low, uh, and is it so? On one level, I want to say that because the, this, it's the surface of it is water. That's so ice is water, but that would but the, that wouldn't necessarily explain why there's. So no when one of the reasons that skates are so good is they're melting the ice in front of them. That yeah. yeah so you've got a you do have so ice skaters do have a layer a thin layer of water that they're gliding on and they're melting the ice in front of them, and um, it reforms behind them. But shouldn't the ice skate be at the same temperature as the ice upon which it skates? So, but your the pressure, the force that you're putting on there is changing the temperature of the ice and, and changing the melting point. So pressure melts ice as well as heat. Yes. And cool. so, and I haven't thought about this in a little while, so I have to. I'd have to. So I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna spitball a little bit of this, but yeah. Well, but, I think there's been some pretty good experiments, like with the wires and little weight 
and stuff to show. Yeah, right, 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 right. And it's and what's interesting there is, and that's exactly an example. So I was about to, just about to describe that. So you want me to describe it a little yes, bit? Yes, more? yes, of course. Without how you pressure take a, melts ice. That's you really take a block of ice. Um, like take a, a quart container and fill it with water and freeze it. Um, and then put that sideways on something and hold it. And then you take a wire, like a little piece of guitar string or piano wire, and just put a couple of weights on it and dangle it over the ice. And so it sits there and you might imagine, well, it melts a little bit, but then it holds up, right? No, it starts to work its way through the ice and pretty soon you've got um a you've got a block of ice with a wire through it right and eventually it would cut through the whole block of ice but what's interesting is that the water you start melting the water below the wire but then the heat that you're taking that you that that it takes to melt that water comes from the water just above the wire and so that freezes. Say that again. Okay. Uh, geez, I wish we had a board. <laughs> uh, I know, I know. A physicist without a board. I know, I know. We'll have to get one on the next generation of Be Live TV. Here's All my right. wire. Here's right. your wire. Right. And uh, here's my block of ice. Okay. Oh, whoop, I guess you can't see that. I see the right. black lights. Raise it up a little higher, a little higher. Yeah. Yep. I got it. There's your I can't, I can't see it. I so do. now let's suppose I can take this I can take this off and I can do it do this here. Right? There we go. All right. So now I've got my wire more or less embedded in the block of ice. Okay. I see that. The wire is gonna start that to melt the um water below. It. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but the energy to melt that has to come from somewhere, and it it's got liquid water just above it. So the heat energy to melt the ice below the wire is coming from the heat of the, wa of the liquid water above the ice, and so that refreezes the melted ice. The yeah, the yeah, melted the ice that's that's above, that's above it. So Right. So now, but now, so so the melting of the 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 melting of the, of the water the the water on the surface of the ice is that the reason that its friction is so low and allows the puck to zip so swiftly down the rink? So I'm not even sure if the puck needs to do that. So there may be a layer of water. Uh, there also is this oh, idea that there's a layer of condensated wa condensed water above from the, the air. air. Right on top of the ice. Right. I don't know the puck is melting the ice, but there is the but there is water on the surface of the ice. Yeah, so I think that's part of it, and um, and then but then the puck itself just it doesn't have any way of digging in. It's not it's not very right. heavy. Um, I don't I don't know what the the you know the the official weight of a of a uh, NHL. Um, uh, official NHL hockey puck is, but it's, it's got to be a few ounces. Five, and yes, between 1.5 and 2 ounces, I think. Okay. Right. Not right. Speaking of puck, oh, mm -hmm. I, speaking of puck, one of the most interesting things uh, that I've run across in this little discussion is this year thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, now, yeah. Tell me, what are we looking at here, boss? Um, so you are looking at a fully loaded uh, 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 hockey stick that's ready to spring into action and so, um, and fling the puck. So this is this is of course you were asking you know how does the puck move so fast? Um, and of course you could just take a swing at it like you would swing a baseball bat or a golf club or something like that and try to um, hit, hit the puck and hit the puck and you know that would get the puck moving pretty fast. But um, I didn't. I didn't realize this. And the and the uh, the the um, <laughs> I the smarter every day guy uh, is uh, he me stuff on a regular basis too. So um, and so he's got a slow mo um, uh, video of of that as the as the so. The bending is due to the interaction between the 
stick and the ice, right? So you could, you could do, you could get the stick to bend like that without the puck. The puck isn't going to do, is going to bend the stick like that at all. It's just not heavy enough. Right, um, right. But the, the, um, the technique is to hit the, is to bring the stick down first, hit the ice so that it drags the stick behind it a little bit and then bends the stick. Right. And so now, now the stick is, it, you essentially got a spring here. Yeah. You right? got a whole bunch, you just built up a bunch, uh, stored up a bunch of potential energy. Stored up a bunch of potential energy in the springiness of the stick. Yeah. And then if once you let go of a little bit of pressure now for on the ice, that stick is now going to spring forward and, and, and slap the, the, the puck forward. So it's not just the, in baseball, the important thing is the collision between the bat and the ball. Right. And it's, it's you, the, the talent of the player is putting the bat in a position where it can collide with a much smaller object and send it off. What I've, what I'm learning about this is that in hockey, the you're not using the mass. It's not the mass of the hockey stick that's important. It's that springiness that's important. It's ability to store up potential energy and then spring the, uh, uh, release that into the uh, the puck. So I, I must say, that I think I look forward to the watching to you know, to paying attention in the next hockey game to that phenomenon because I really didn't. I didn't really think about it. It makes complete and obvious sense. And I'm sure that I, as I now think it through, I have seen that phenomenon occur, that, that, that smacking of the ice. And, and probably, and I'm, I'll bet you anything now that if I watch, I will notice the springiness of the bending of the stick. And I'll, I'll remember. Now, so what do we, how would we describe that in, in, in a physical sense? So we were saying that the, strike, that the striking of the ice and the bending of the stick stores potential energy within the the the, head, the stick itself. Like compressing a spring. Like compressing a spring, right? Like compressing okay. a spring. Uh, it's not it's not a nice curly cued spring. It's like or um, what what's the other? Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a an example of a. Uh, uh, where you, you pull something, you pull like a little, like, oh, like a pulling a spoon back, right? Yeah, I want to, yeah right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who hasn't done it, that? Right? <laughs> right. And of course, you're not bending the spoon. It, that That's all, it's all in your, your finger when you're pulling it back and you're, you're letting it go, right? But you're, you can, or you can imagine taking a, um, a, 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 a wooden stirrer. Whoop. I just, I've been I've been drinking coffee and I was looking to see if I brought the stirrer along, but uh, taking a wooden stirrer and you can put a little bit of spring into that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, or something like that. So, so this is definitely elastic potential energy that I would say is stored up in here, um, and it's uh, and you know there's all sorts of interesting things going on in terms of analyzing the uh the shear forces and the, the load on this hockey stick and where it potentially can break and uh what uh what the possibility is so what, look for a broken stick um <laughs> in the I, say, I, I was about to say that i don't think i've ever seen a, a hockey stick break let me just say over oh, my uh, our buddy wilton uh, Wilton Mitten is here, and Wilton is a former high school science teacher and a very smart and fun guy as well. Uh, but so this is, I'm speaking, of course, with uh, my one of my absolute favorite physics professors in the world and my absolute unequivocal favorite improvising professor, Professor Nicholas Gross, professor of physics at Boston University, and my buddy. And so uh, when we're talking hockey, because it is the NHL season, the Stanley Cup playoffs are here, the Bruins. Though they had a very good season, they had a very impressive season, unlike the Blackhawks, where the Bruins are out of it. But we, it is still fun to think about some of the physics involved in hockey as we watch those other teams that are better and better. So one of the other things, one of the other interesting bits of physics having to do with hockey, and again, I guess everything, once again, a reason to talk about, talk about Mr. Newton, is mm -hmm. checking. 
checking oh, yeah. out those really interesting things. The first hockey game I ever saw, I saw the guy at the puck, player at the puck, and somebody checked him into the wall, just smacked him, ran into him, smashed him up against the boards. And I thought, well, that's obviously going to be a foul. And the announcer says, brilliant check. That was just a great piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. But, okay, first of all, so we're talking collisions. Okay. Tell me a little about collisions and the physics of them in hockey. Right. So I think there's there's two things to think about. You know, one is the sort of whole conservation momentum thing. And, and, and you know, of course – What's the half, the time, half the time I see a check, it's 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 uneven. Um, that is, you know, one guy's one guy's going hell hell for leather down the uh, down the ice, and the other guy's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so, uh, so, and and oftentimes, and of course, what happens in that case is that. Uh, the the guy who's stationary, right, is um, – I'm trying to think about stationary here. So there's stationary, right? The guy who's stationary now suddenly gets some momentum imparted to him. Right. And we – whenever we model this in an intro physics class, it's it's always, well, you know, and what's his, what's his final velocity as if he's just going to go backwards, you know? Um, but, of course, there's also then – the torque, right? Because you're like you're kind of like standing. You maybe I don't know if you're state. Maybe you're if you're stationary, right? You're kind of standing there. Maybe you're moving slowly, but now your feet are attached to the ice, and your chest takes an impact, and so now you're going to rotate around your feet. You see, now this proves, my friend, that you are not a real theoretical physicist. Because a real theoretical physicist would first assume that the player was a cylinder. <laughs> you have to assume the player is a cylinder and with two perfectly shaped uh, blades at the, at the bottom of that cylinder. Then it's very simple. I don't know. I don't know. Well, you still get you still get some you're going to get some torque around. I mean, even yeah. that. That's well, a, well, I, thought, well, I thought you were going to go to the spherical cow thing. <laughs> right, well, that, that's kind of what I was going for. Was a version of the spherical cow or the spherical horse or something I mean, like that. Two cil- you know, two or three cylinders are sort of torso and then two two legs. Um, <laughs> it's not a bad is is not a bad model. And I, I and you know, my students look at me funny when I when I try and get them to think that way. It's like, you know, you know, if I start trying to think about all the complexity, it's just gonna make you crazy. Um, but but so you're still gonna get torque around um unless unless you around did, some point unless unless it is struck with the cylinder the perfect cylinder with the perfect blades is struck at exactly the perfect right center point such that there is no more torque of- and you know what <laughs> i think these guys have figured out where that point is and avoid it <laughs> <laughs> yes well again this is i'm just running my mouth here this is not a true <laughs> so so uh but in, on the basic kind of a uh, third law level Mm-hmm. Right. That the can you explain that what I'm what I'm talking about with that in terms of yeah. when so, so the third law Newton's so Newton has his three laws of physics that turn out to be provide you with a closed set a uh, closed description and if you solve problems with those you don't have to put in anything else. Um, into the into the the physics. That's the physics that's involved. Um, you don't have to start if you are if you apply those correctly. You don't have to start um, adding extra things in and start trying to think too too hard. And we like the physicists yeah, right. like to think hard. I mean, I, it sounds it sounds counterintuitive, but really we like to like figure out. Let's figure out how to make this easy. So the third law says that if two objects collide, um, the force exerted by object A on object B is going to be the same force exerted by object B on object A. Forces come in pairs. The forces come in pairs. And it's 
It's the matched pairs between two objects. So um, if, if in, in the virtual world, if I could push through the screen and push on your shoulders, right? Um, then even without you, so we could imagine doing, we can imagine doing this on ice, right? We could imagine that if we were both um, on, on, on ice skates, on a, on a nice pond someplace in New Hampshire in the winter, you know, courier and I sort of thing, right? I like, um, this. I like this. Okay, I'm, I'm digging this. <laughs> and I was behind you, and I and I gave you a push. You would go forwards, and I would go backwards. Right. Okay. Because yeah. I'm pushing on you, and but I'm you're pushing back on me. Even even though you're not physically pushing on me, the force I'm applying to you pushes back on me as well. But so now on ice, the equations get more interesting because the amount because the amount of force that I can exert on you is mitigated by the the, the backward motion on the skates that would apply more so than on the land because on, on land you know I'm a much more stable object but on the ice then. <laughs> So you've got an extra force on land. You've got an extra force acting right. on you. Well, gravity interacts more and more strongly on land than it does on on the ice. But the I more, wouldn't say it that way. I would say that the friction of the well, the, no, that, yes, gravity okay. is the same. Right, gravity is the same. The friction is different. Yes. No, yeah. but you didn't know the gravity changes in an ice rink. You didn't know about that. Oh, that's one of the. It's, it's, it's a far, very advanced. There's a little microgravity change because that's exactly the, right. Density right. The right. Is, right. under you because it's water instead of. Uh, uh. Yeah, right. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I we 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 are a little we are running near about to be out of time here, but let me just say I'm delighted. So let us think. So the game is always here, is to be to end with a happy ending, to end optimistically. All right? Optimistically. Yes. So let us think optimistically. If we're looking for an optimistic take on the physics of, uh, of hockey. Okay? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. Yep, so yep, yep, one yep. Thing, one thing that's extremely optimistic, one thing that's extremely optimistic and fun, uh, one of the th- things that I really adore, and some people say is one of the points of science communication, is to present the notion that the world is comprehensible. Right. And so that this discussion is an example of the fact that the world is comprehensible via those three Newtonian laws of motion. Whole, that hockey, the NHL, the playoffs, the Stanley Cup, you can really understand genuinely any one of us knuckleheads because the laws are not that, you know, anybody can figure that out. We have all studied them. And so I consider that a really wonderful thing because I think to understand is to gain more joy. Yes. No, it's, and, and it's, I think we talked about this in a previous video about my, you know, tenets of belief that the world is comprehensible, that there's no, uh, there aren't things that are beyond our ability to, to analyze and construct and, and put together. And so, and I, yes, I, I get more joy out of the world because I can start to look around and, and, uh, put some of these patterns on there and some of these these ways of thinking about things. And I also get joy out of hearing what other people see. What do you mean? Oh, so, well, di- different people with different backgrounds, different experiences. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Peggy, for example, um, yeah. and, you know, and, and sees, you know, looks at the same, looks at exactly the same thing. Yes. I'm looking at green trees out there. And I'm thinking about the wavelengths of light, and she's thinking about the physiological interaction of. of uh, We're uh, going to have to get you and Peggy on here <laughs> together. This will be really fun. All right, but for now, it's always easier that there's a greater physical appreciation of the world attendant to everyone who listens to my ace pal, Mr. Professor, Dr. Cool improviser Nick Gross. Thanks so much, brother. Hope we can chat next week about something else. Aaron, Aaron that would be great. I always love talking to you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Thank you, thank you, Lan- thank you, Wilton. Mwah. See you soon, brother. Thank you, everybody.